class, welcome back. We're going to continue our chapter on materials with a lesson on alloys and electrical properties of material. To give you a quick recap of what we covered last time, we talked about the properties of materials which included mechanical properties, physical properties, and chemical properties. Mechanical properties refers primarily to the strength and malleability and hardness of material. The strength of material can be described in terms of compression strength, that is how much weight can a material support, or tensile or tension strength, which is a measure of how much weight a material can support before it, it breaks. Physical properties include such things as the ability to conduct electricity or conduct heat, uh, as well as magnetic and optical properties. And the chemical properties include such things as inflammability, resistance to corrosion, and resistance to water, things of that sort. We then talked about some composite materials that should be familiar to you, such as things like plywood and reinforced concrete, fabric composites, and then we introduced a sort of modern type of composite material, metal matrix composites, and we gave some examples. And these composites are very strong and lightweight. In this lesson, I want to talk about alloys. Now, alloys are a type of composite material involving metals in which two or more metals are blended together to form a new material which has advantageous properties. Now, one of the first, if not the first, alloy created by man was bronze. Now, going back to our prehistoric times, gold was a metal that always fascinated man because it was yellowish and shiny, had, uh, had luster, and it was used for making jewelry and statues, but gold is not very prevalent. But copper is more abundant, and metallurgists worked with copper Copper is very malleable and easy to hammer into various shapes. Metallurgists discovered that if copper were heated with and blended with tin, another available metal, it formed this material called bronze. Now, bronze doesn't have the nice luster. Bronze is a more brownish material, but it is very hard and resist corrosion and was good for making tools including swords and shields but also tools for agriculture and containers for cooking and for carrying water and things of that sort. So we had the Bronze Age and bronze dominated the development of human civilizations for two or three thousand years. Metallurgists then discovered either by accident or by design that if they heated copper with zinc or with an ore that happened to contain zinc, they created another alloy, which we now call brass. And brass is a little bit more attractive in some sense. It has more of the yellow, shiny luster, similar to gold. It has a lower melting point, making it even easier to work with and to cast into various shapes. It also has a lower friction, which gave it some advantages. And so we use brass now in such things as gears and plumbing and ammunition casings. It also has good acoustical properties so that we use it in making horns. You've heard of brass quintet. You may also know that coin, including pennies, are made out of bronze or copper or brass. And in fact, pennies have been made from different materials over the years. At one period of time, pennies were made out of bronze, and I show you a bronze penny, and then pennies were made out of brass. Currently, pennies are made primarily out of zinc with a thin copper outer coating. Another alloy of importance is steel, which is an alloy of iron with a variety of other elements. In fact, there are just hundreds of different kinds of steel. There's carbon steel, nickel steel, cobalt containing steel. Steel in general is very hard and less corrosive than iron and so is used in construction a great deal. And I just show you that there was one year, 1943, when our penny was actually made out of steel. It's called a steel penny or what you may have heard of as the steely. Another alloy that you probably have heard about and, and maybe even used is what we call solder. And solder can be either soft solder or hard solder. Soft solder is an alloy of tin and lead, typically in a 60-40 ratio, and it, you would use that if you're doing any electrical work and soldering things together. 
the greater the tin composition in solder, the greater the tensile strength. Hard solder is, is different. It is based on copper with either zinc or silver, and it's used in silversmithing, and it has a, a fairly high melting point. Moving on to other properties of materials, let's talk about electrical properties. Now, in general, matter can either conduct electricity or not conduct electricity. Conductors of electricity carry electric current. Most metals are conductors of electricity. I show you an example of, of a wire. This would be a copper wire. Copper is a very good a conductor, as is aluminum. But then other materials are insulators. They do not conduct electricity or conduct very little. In our wires, the, the plastic insulation on the outside is, is an example of a material that does not conduct electricity. Wood, stone, ceramics, many plastics, most biological materials are not conductors of electricity to any appreciable degree. So why do some materials conduct electricity and other materials not conduct electricity? And are there materials that have properties that are in between? Well, yes, and we call these semiconductors, the tweeners. They are neither good conductors nor good insulators. And silicon is an example of a semiconductor material. Silicon conducts electricity about a million times less efficiently than copper, but it is still not an insulator. Now, the bottom part of this slide gives you a explanation or a way to think about why certain materials conduct electricity and other materials do not in terms of what is called the band gap explanation. So let's first look at the left where we describe materials that are insulators. If you think back to the molecular description of diamond, for example, where carbon is bonded to four other carbons by covalent bonds, in an insulator such as diamond, the electrons are localized in the covalent bonds and essentially have to stay put between the atoms because they are components of the bonds that, that link the atoms together. On the other hand, if we look at the right, we show a description of a material that conducts electricity. And let's, let's think back to the metallic bonding model that we described earlier in a previous chapter, where in the matrix of a solid, the nuclei are in a more or less fixed positions, and electrons can hop or swim between the various nuclei. In our band gap explanation, we would say that the electrons are in a conduction band. That is, they can hop between the nuclei and they're not localized in between or on any particular nuclei. So that would be our description of a conductor, something like a metal or metallic bonding. Well, a semiconductor is in between. Instead of having the electrons completely localized in what we call a valence band, or being able to swim around in what we call a conduction band. In a semiconductor, there is a modest gap between the valence band and the conduction band. And what is called a band gap is small enough so the electrons can occasionally jump up into the conduction band and be conducted, but most of the time they stay in the valence band. So they are a semiconductor. They can conduct a little bit, but not nearly as well as a conductor, but they're also not perfect insulators. So this is the band gap explanation for why some materials are insulators, some, such as metals, are conductors, and some materials like silicon can be a semiconductor. Well, in general, if we think about metals, which are conductors, as we lower temperature, it is found that the resistance to the conduction electricity decreases. Now, one way to imagine this is if we have an array of nuclei and the electrons are trying to swim through these nuclei, if the nuclei vibrate, uh, this provides a little bit of resistance to that swimming path. But if we lower temperature, the nuclei of the atoms of a metal stay put. They don't vibrate as much, and so there's an easier path for the conduction of electricity. But in general, with normal metals, as we lower temperature, there is a decrease in electrical resistance, or in other words, an increase in conductivity. However, when scientists studied the conduction of metals as a function of temperature, there were a few very early discoveries. 
they found, for example, that lead and also mercury, when you lower temperature to a certain very low temperature, and we're talking about extremely low temperatures, approaching absolute zero, but when you lower the temperature of lead or mercury to below 10 degrees, suddenly the resistance to the conduction of electricity just fell off a cliff to zero resistivity. Or in other words, the conductivity towards electricity increased infinitely after, at this critical temperature. That is, lead and mercury became perfect conductors of electricity below this critical temperature. Now this seemed like an anomaly, perhaps. But scientists then continued to study other materials and found that other, other metals and other metallic compounds and composites had similar properties. And we call these materials superconductors, materials that conduct electricity extremely well below a certain critical temperature. They have no resistance to the flow of electrons below this temperature. But if it only happens below, say, 10 degrees Kelvin, then how important can this be because it's so difficult to achieve that low temperature? Well, scientists, of course, attempted to search for higher temperature superconductors, that is, materials that would have this critical temperature at higher and higher temperature. And one of the reasons for interest in this superconducting phenomena is the Meissner effect. Not only do these materials become infinite conductors of electricity below this critical temperature, but one of the phenomena of, of superconducting materials is that they expel magnetic fields. Now a consequence of this then is that if a material is, becomes a superconductor, it would repel a magnet. And as you can see in this picture, and you'll see in the video that follows, when a material moves into the superconducting low temperature mode, it will have actually levitate a magnet. So we'll pause and look at the video of the Meissner effect. So the superconducting material is the brick looking thing and the cylinder is a magnet. Now he's adding liquid nitrogen to cool the superconducting material. And notice what happens. Levitation. Now he will allow superconducting material to, to warm up and you'll see that the levitation goes away. Okay, so pretty interesting. So superconducting magnets, how are they used or how could they be used if in fact we could create superconducting material at higher and higher temperatures. Well, first of all, you've probably heard of magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, MRI machines in many hospitals. These use superconducting magnets to achieve a very strong magnetic field. What's the connection? You remember from earlier discussions of electricity and magnetism that a rotating electric field produces a magnetic field. If the superconductors below their critical temperature have no resistance to the flow of electricity, once we get the electrons going in a circle, we create a magnetic field. And it can be a very strong magnetic field, which is then used in these instruments called magnetic resonance in imaging devices, or MRI. We also just saw examples of levitation of magnets above the superconducting materials. So that leads to, to the design of such things as the maglev, high-speed train. And in Japan, we have some prototypes. By levitating either the tracks or 
the superconducting material and the train, the bottom of the train is a magnet or vice versa so that there would be levitation as soon as we lower the temperature of the superconducting material below the critical temperature. This would reduce resistance allowing the trains to go much faster and operate more efficiently. In addition, this could lead to a number of other practical uses with motors that had lower resistance leading to lower energy loss. Now, this explains some of the potential uses of superconducting supermaterials. How far have we advanced? Well, the chart on the right shows the timeline of the discovery of various superconducting materials along with the temperature at which they operate. So when we're below 20 degrees, we have to be operating with liquid helium. Achieving those, lo those low temperatures is nearly impossible. But as you can see, beginning around 1986 and 1987, a number of higher temperature superconducting materials were created, many of these ceramic materials. And we are now approaching the temperature of the night on the moon or liquid nitrogen, which is 77 degrees, because we obviously saw examples of the superconducting material at liquid nitrogen temperatures. But we are approaching higher temperatures, 150 degrees or so Kelvin, as the temperature at which these are operating. Now, to give you some context, because you're probably not as familiar with the Kelvin temperature scale, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is, of course, 0 degrees centigrade, which is 273 Kelvin. So most of you are familiar with temperatures of 273 Kelvin. We experienced that on a cold day and you've probably experienced temperatures a little bit lower, maybe maybe 260 degrees Kelvin. So when we talk about 150 degrees, we're talking about 100 degrees on the Kelvin scale or the centigrade scale below that. So we're still talking very, very low temperatures, but a little bit more practical. Okay, we'll pause now and have a quiz or an exercise. I will interject that because this topic is a, a little bit far out there, a little bit interesting, we're, we're going to have another lecture or two to describe superconducting materials before I return to continue the discussion of magnetic properties of materials.